Hello, hello. We have a new developer's note <laughs> for end of July, almost August, actually, if you think about it, uh, for Niki. So we're going to dive into it and look at what the developers have for us. So first and foremost, they have some improvements. So they're fixing the random patterns uh, for solo raid, which is very welcome change as many of the previous solo raid bosses. It was improved in the latest one, but it was still some RNG mold here and there with the laser beam, for example, whether it targets too much one specific Nike and destroys your cover and then one taps your Nike afterwards with upcoming mechanics or with the RNG fiesta that blacksmith was that was absolutely disgusting amounts of RNG. So this change is very much welcome that they're trying to fix it and that they are addressing it, which is the random portion of solo raid, which creates this very annoying gameplay for people that are trying to go for score, where you have to reset over and over and over in the hopes of getting good RNG. And then once you get good RNG, you also need to play properly. So it just adds to a lot of frustrations that are completely unnecessary. So the criteria for solo raid is also being changed, which is a very welcome change in that regard as well. Instead of making it only for the top 1% getting the frame three and so on, it will be to the top 3%. Removing a little bit of that gatekeeping is always welcome so that more people can strive for higher scores and maybe attempt to get it. Because I know a lot of people, sometimes even myself, in, like even myself included actually, I wouldn't even say sometimes, a lot of people just give up on getting frames because of how restrictive some of those ranks are. Top 1% is incredibly restrictive. I know there will be people in the comments saying, yeah, top 1% is so easy to get and whatnot. It's not easy. The reality is to get top 1%, you need to be better than 99% of the player base. It's pure mathematics. So it's not a matter of it being easy. It's just a matter of, well, you're better than... You, either your account is better than 99% of the player base or you're better than 99% of the player base or both, right? So making it a little bit less restrictive is a welcome change for sure so that more people can get their shiny frames and feel very happy about it because i know a lot of people really enjoy the aesthetic part of it right so there are also some quick battle on clear stages for challenge modes which is something that i don't know that well what they're trying to say on this one Ease of play of challenge mode in all events, enabling quick battle in cleared stages. So once you have cleared the stage, you can quick battle it for farming it. But it is challenge mode, so I always assume that you would just clear ev Well, maybe it's a big assumption. Some players will get stuck and probably will re-clear the same stage over and over. So this stage, this change is probably welcome for those who are stuck in lower challenge mode and just want to, you know, use their strikes without molding too much, right? So that is a decent quality of life change regardless. I'm not 100% sure what they mean on that one, but I will assume that is what they mean. So they're also exploring a system for whenever a union leader becomes inactive, they get automatically succeeded by another member that is active. So this is a very welcome change for unions. It's not a problem for mine, but it is a very welcome change for unions that have a lot of active players, but the leaders, the leader of, of the union just stopped playing the game. Uh, he could have real life issues. He could just get bored of the game. And it kind of just gets everyone stuck in, uh, in this very annoying situation where they either have to make a new union or wait for him to relog. So it is a very welcome change for said unions to have these type of changes. So there is also a change that I welcome personally quite a lot, which is the introduction of a battle setting to remove that infamous zoom in that happens when the boss of the stage enters the field. All of you guys know of that. It's like whenever the boss rapture of the stage enters the field, you have this dramatic zoom in while it enters and everything. It's a bit annoying because it changes your aim position or whatever you're trying to kill. 
uh, gets shifted away and you just don't kill it anymore and it can fail your stages. So for me, it's a very welcome change because I have missed so many Snow White shots or shots in general that I wanted to take because of this enter the battlefield effect of the Raptors. Well, enter the battlefield effect. I sound like I'm freaking talking Magic the Gathering. Oh, well. But yes, there's also a change for um, scopes in uh, sniper rifles where it's not blurry around anymore. Now, this is a change that doesn't affect me very much because I use mostly snipers for the sake of quick scoping for um, different uh, for multiple purposes. And you guys know that I mostly use Snow White, so... But I assume that this is a change that a lot of players were looking forward to, and that is why they implemented it. So, the other thing as well is they're discussing the changes of the regrouping of SP Arena, and are looking into improving it. So I don't know what they're trying to improve here. Maybe make it so that it feels a little bit less intense in terms of competition. Like my, my arena has a lot of players hitting each other and then a couple of top players that are just untouchable uh, because they're from top five unions and they are so far ahead of everyone else that they're like those slots are just completely locked in place and there's absolutely no touching them because you will lose if you try to strike them. So maybe they're trying to fix that by making it so that outliers are not as common in SP Arena uh, regrouping cycle. That would be my assumption. Um, the other thing as well is the most controversial part of this is the sanctioning of the macro program usage. Now, it makes sense to make this, right? I will go through the pros and cons, but I will say why it makes sense. Macros are not inbuilt tools. So there always be an advantage of those who use macros versus those who do not. It's not a matter of you choose or not. It's a matter of, well, some people know how to make them. Some people have the hardware to make them because for example, mobile players and tablet players, as far as I know, do not have that option of creating macros properly or as potent as the ones that are on PC. And there are a lot of players that are exclusively mobile and tablet only. Uh, not, not everyone has a PC, not everyone enjoys playing on PC, so it makes sense. And many competitive and non-competitive games have a varying degree of similar rule sets for this. So there is like this famous sentence that I heard many years ago in one of the games that I used to play, which was one press, one action rule uh, for that game. So. It makes sense to do it. Guild Wars 2 had it, Blade and Soul had it, many other games had it, but there are also games that encourage this type of things by building them inside of the game. This will be relevant as well later, so uh, keep in mind why I'm referring to it. World of Warcraft, for example, is a game that I personally know very well. I played it for 14, 15 years. I played it like since vanilla all the way up until now. Now I'm far more casual, but I've played it for many, many years, and I have seen the evolution of the whole macro and add-on situation. So, World of Warcraft supports macro creation inside of the game. They have an inbuilt tool to create macros, and they also support add-ons. They have always given a support so that people could create add-ons and use them. And in that sense, they're always fair game because the developers support them. However, they actually had, after many years, to draw a line in the sand when it came to add-ons because add-ons became developed and became so potent that they essentially were almost playing the game for people. They were trivializing entirely complex mechanics and people who had the add-ons that trivialized the mechanics had a much easier time than those who did not, which was an issue. And it, they had to make a policy announcement saying that Okay, add-ons are cool, but not beyond a certain level of how much they trivialize the game. Which is kind of similar to what Nikki was doing. They kind of waited and they decided, okay, macros are way too potent for what we're trying to do in the game. So we are going to draw a line in the sand and said, macros are not fair game. So why is this relevant is that if it impacts the game too much, it's reasonable to ban it, but also it creates a situation where 
you have this dichotomy, right? And this dichotomy between people that have it and don't have it, I will mention it in the pros and cons. So the pros, of course, being a more even competitive playing field because PC already has a massive advantage, right? A very big advantage due to frame rate differences between mobile users and tablet users versus powerful PCs with the built-in client. So if you add on top of that another layer of advantages, then people who play exclusively on mobile and tablets are just being left behind in the dust in terms of these competitive advantages due to the macros. And it makes sense. I know a lot of players that play exclusively on tablet and phone, and they're trying to be decently competitive of the game, but they have frustrations because, well, they cannot use macros. They don't have a PC or they just, yeah, cannot uh, play Nikkei on PC. And that is a reality. It also creates this issue where if you cannot afford a PC, well, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> and that is an issue that probably the developers are trying to address. So there is also the other issue is that for those who play on PC, some people would argue, well, why don't the people who play on PC just make macros? It's so easy. Well, a lot of people don't know how to set up macros, even if they wanted to. And in some cases, it's also a hardware advantage because some hardware, for example, I have a gaming mouse that I use for MMOs and everything. I can set up macros instead of that mouse. I decided not to because I was sure that this banning of macros was going to eventually happen on Nikkei, so I never really bothered creating macros for Nikkei on the mouse. But some mouses and keyboards and everything have inbuilt hardware, uh, software, I mean, that make it easier over other keyboard and mouses. So there is, like, at some point, it kind of becomes a weapons race for people who are trying to compete in terms of hardware advantage, software advantage, and everything. And this is something that the developers of Nikkei are trying to just nip in the bud, which is understandable. <laughs> it's very understandable. So that's the second pro. And the third pro is what I was mentioning at this dichotomy, because this might be nipping in the bud a very, very toxic dichotomy that could start appearing in the game. And this is something that I'm very familiar with as someone who played World of Warcraft, as I said, for nearly 15 years now. The usage of the third-party tools that I mentioned, which, were support, uh, which are supported by the developers, by the way, it can kind of create this very toxic divide between players. Um, as competition becomes more and more intense, and it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say this for unions as well, especially the high-rank unions, it wouldn't be surprising to me at all to see unions have the requirement if the devs left the macro issue unchecked to have this rule of use macro or get kicked type of rule. It would make sense because macros are an inherent competitive advantage because they allow you to perfectly do uh, reproduce a specific rhythm or a specific set of key strokes and the like. So these type of rule sets, if it sounds too far-fetched to you, keep in mind that in World of Warcraft, I play that mythic rating level, and I've been in quite a few guilds that have quite literally a list of mandatory add-ons before you can raid with them. Otherwise, you don't really get to join the raid, which is the high-end content with them. Quite literally a form of gatekeeping in the form of add-ons, and I could see this, hap this type of gatekeeping happen in Nikkei. If you think it will only affect the top unions, that's where you're wrong, because this add-ons or get or don't get to raid uh, rule started off first in top uh, guilds in World of Warcraft, but then it started trickling down because as other guilds started seeing that the top unions were doing the top guilds or unions in the case of Nikkei are doing that, well they started putting those rules as well to try to emulate or mimic the success of the ones that are above them. And eventually, even the more casual, heroic uh, raiding guilds, and even in some cases, normal raiding guilds, uh, started implementing this rule of, if you don't have these specific mandatory add-ons, you don't get to raid with us. And this created a lot of bitterness in the community uh, for people that don't enjoy using add-ons. They don't enjoy using weak auras, they don't enjoy using boss mods. And 
it kind of festered this very toxic relationship between people who don't like add-ons at all and those who are mandatorily enforcing add-ons otherwise you don't get to join the raid for the guild um some argue that well is it really skillful gameplay if add-ons help you so much with so many aspects of the game and people of course that use add-ons got a little bit pissed off and it created like this very festering issue of toxicity and elitism and it became kind of like a never-ending cycle it also created another issue that people are probably not realizing when they're going pro macro in this case is that if the developers allow, allow macro usage they also need to tune things while keeping the existence of those macros in mind so they might tune things into being harder and harder unnecessarily so because they're keeping at the back of their heads the fact that macro users exist which also creates this never-ending cycle of use macros or get kicked or at some point you have to use macros and at some point it will alienate people that you play on mobile or tablet and that is an actual issue a very very big issue and why am i saying this it's because it happened in world of warcraft it actually happened as add-ons became more and more powerful boss mods became par more powerful and more powerful and gave you more and more information the developers because they supported these add-on usage had to tune encounters around the existence of uh, all of these weak auras, boss mods, add-ons, timers, and everything. Sure, those timers and everything are within the rule set that they, that they put, where players still have to play the game, and they still are actively being skillful, but at the same time, it trivializes so many mechanics that the devs need to make them more threatening. And it created this never-ending cycle that World of Warcraft is in, where they cannot detach themselves from add-ons. On the other side of the spectrum, you have Final Fantasy, which officially bans all forms of add-ons and third-party software. And they don't have this issue at all. Everyone is, in that regard, on an even playing field because there is no add-ons, there is no such thing. And there is no need to tune encounters around having said add-ons. So all of the encounters are more tuned towards in-game visuals. Now, this might seem like a very big uh, off-topic, but it is a reality that could happen in Nikkei. If the developers supported the usage of macro of macros, or at least allowed them through third-party programs, it means also that they would have to tune a lot of things around that. And that could sour the environment for a lot of players that either don't enjoy the usage of macros, or just cannot use the macros, period. And that is something to always keep in mind. Now, on the cons, there is one con that I personally have seen that really worries me, and that is very true. It is fatigue and accessibility. Some players use macros not really because they want to be like top-end competitive players. It's mostly because they have health issues or handicaps. They exist as well in World of Warcraft, and they use what we call lazy macros which are macros meant to limit the amount of button presses to try to do as much dps without putting their own health at risk in that regard because yes there's people that have joint problems have had accidents with their hands broke their bones or have had carpal tunnel in the past and don't want it to flare up again and there is this joke that playing alice without a macro is a leading cause for carpal tunnel which honestly because of the spammy gameplay that she can have and other not just alice actually like anything that requires very spammy gameplay like rocket launchers and snipers in current nikkei could lead to fatigue if you play for a lot of hours i've had some fatigue where i had to take small breaks during my streams because of playing too long but I cannot imagine if I had done that while playing Alice, I would probably be fatigued even faster. There's also the fact that yes, these people that have these handicaps and well, these health issues are getting screwed over by, you know, the removal of the excess of macros. It also, yeah, it is a real concern. I mean, it's a real concern as well for repetitive stress injuries for playing too much Nikkei without 
something to ease it. Now, some people might say, well, you could just auto and take a break. The thing is, as much as people call Nikkei an idle game, I don't agree with that definition because the deeper you delve into the gameplay, the more involved it becomes, the more you have to actively play min-max and I wouldn't say min-max because a lot of people have gotten very far without doing too harsh min-maxing, except for competitive things like uh, solo raid, union raid and the like. But you have to be quite actively involved. I would, I don't think that many people would be capable of clearing very deep hard chapters or very deep uh, story chapters, as well as challenge solo raid or level 10 union raid while fully on auto. They, might, they may exist, but at the end of the day, the vast majority of players just cannot do that. Heck, a lot of players cannot even clear um, Special Interception fully on auto, and that is a reality. So, saying just play on auto is not a fix for it. So, what should the developers actually do about this? Well, one way of dealing with it is to, which in my opinion is the most realistic thing, is to make a toggable option that imperfectly, and this is very important, it has to be imperfect, replicates the what macros currently do. Now, why I say it's very important for it to be imperfect is because players choosing to play optimally, even though it removes all the fun from the game, is a very, very real concept when it comes to any type of game, especially competitive ones. So, if the built-in toggle macro replication option for people that have disabilities is way too good. Even players that don't have disabilities or health issues will just straight up use them. And that is what happened when I mentioned the lazy macros uh, for people with disabilities in World of Warcraft. Some of them were so potent that regular players started using them as well, which became an issue. The other way of doing it, which is less realistic in my opinion, but it could benefit long term, is to rework how Alice, Snipers, Rocket Launchers, and all of these very spammy Nikes and classes uh, play to prevent this uber spammy gameplay. The problem is that there's people that enjoy this spammy gameplay, they really enjoy it. And also, this rework could alter the balance in ways that are probably not intended and create more issues down the road. So it is possibly a better long-term solution, but at the same time, it could cause actually more issues long-term. Now on to the next part, sorry for the very long explanation, but it is a very controversial topic when it comes to uh, the macro banning. And I thought I would wade in with some of my personal gaming experience so that you guys have at least a few more opinions on the matter. You probably don't care about it, but <laughs> I hope at least it interests you um, some insights of what I've personally experienced in regards to something similar to the macro. So, the other part is Summer Part 2. A lot of news about the Summer Part 2 we are getting, which is, well, first and foremost, it's going to be fully voice acted. It's fully voice acted just like Overzone. That is insane for a summer event, especially part two summer event. So I'm very hyped. I really liked Overzone being fully voice acted. I'm really excited about this. It's something that, <coughs> I mean, I hope it's wishful thinking because it would be way too expensive for the developers. But my inner hope is that they make every single event fully voice acted, but that will never happen. This is something at least that makes that puts a massive grin on my face because I just love when the events are voice acted. It adds that much more weight to everything and it's just... Uh, I just love it. I just love it. There will be a barbecue activity, so we'll have to see what the barbecue activity is. I assume it's kind of like these mini games that we've had in the past. Like, for example, the Christmas Rupee event, uh, the uh, Vault event, um, we could also, it could also be like the snow, uh, the white memory minigame. I would love if it was like a um, uh, white memory minigame, actually. If the barbecue activity is like a white memory event, I would be stoked out of my mind. But it's probably more similar to what happened during the Christmas event. There will also be the Kraken. So that is, I, I wonder if it's going to be a new boss. 
I'm really excited about that as well. We're gonna fight a Kraken. So please shift up. Unleash the Kraken. This is... Uh, I'm, I'm so excited for this. I probably sound way too excited, but yeah, I'm just hyped for this way too much. There will be also a short animation, so I really like those. The Laplace animation in chapter 18, the latest animation as well in chapter 21 or 22, I believe, with Polly and Miranda. So I'm really looking forward to what they're going to make. Also the famous Marion animation that gripped our hearts very early on. And there will also be new BGMs, so... Cosmograph, please don't burn yourself out, but we're looking forward to what you're cooking up this time around, as well as the other ones. There's also the Modernia skin that was announced in Overzone for players as a thank you for the half anniversary. It's finally going to be available in August the 24th. So that is, we have a time frame now, as well as the five avatar frames. Those five avatar frames are also with the Doki Doki uh, popularity contest where the top five all get an avatar and the winner which was Marian or Modernia uh, depending on how you want to call her was the winner and gets a unique level costume so unique level for those who are wondering what it means is it's a free costume on the same level of quality as the Drake and Rupee Gacha skin. So this is a free skin that has unique character cutscenes and we'll also have a short story about the costume. So this is going to be very exciting stuff. So everyone will get a very nice Marian skin or Modernia, however you want to call her, that has unique cutscenes. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the cutscene will be. And lastly, it's like a little bit of an afterword by the devs where they say that they're trying to learn from their mistakes as much as possible, which really shows. They've made so many changes listening to so much feedback. It's actually impressive. Uh, like, if you guys don't believe me, play some other gacha games and you will see that many gacha games, some of which are incredibly popular, just stonewall the community and just don't listen to, it, uh, to them. At least most of the time, which is... Like, Nikkei is one of the games that I've played that listen the most to the community, as far as I have seen. Whether you want to say that I'm simping for them or not, I don't care. Honestly, this just comes from my pure personal experience. And the lead developer uh, and director is saying that maybe he'll do some more communication because he's mostly focused on realizing promises. So he feels he may have been a little bit too passive on communication, which is very true. Communications on Nikkei are slow um, to arrive, especially, for example, these type of developer notes, which a roadmap or more communication or even streams with the developers would be very welcome addition. So addressing and, you know, communicating with a more open mindset, as he says, which means also, you know, communicating more is very, very welcome uh, for the developers. And yeah, they're doing a lot of work that is pretty impressive. So my respect to the developers. This is very exciting stuff. A lot of stuff to unpack. And I'm very much looking forward to the summer event now. <laughs> I hope you guys are excited and thanks a lot. Well, I hope you guys are ex as, as excited as I am uh, because we will be getting Swimsuit Anis, Swimsuit Helm, which I'm very much looking forward to so many good changes as well and yeah fully voice acted event like, i'm so excited for it I'm actually like i don't know i'm just grinning from ear to ear with that but yeah that will be it from me i hope this informed you in one way or another and i'll see you guys on the next video